Dane here and welcome to part number seven of my bookshelf tour. I guess by this point there's not much point really introducing this any further than that so without further ado let's go. In our last video we got up to the gigantic beard that was evil and I can't remember who that's by but building on from that we move on to the next author which is Chris Columbus and Ned Vizzini. This is House of Secrets. Uh, this is the first book and then here we have House of Secrets, Battle of the Beasts, which is the second book. Now, I believe Ned Vizzini is the guy who sadly committed suicide, didn't he? He was the uh, author of It's Kind of a Funny Story. Is Chris Columbus like a film producer or something? I'm sure he is. Anyway, these are actually really good books. They're, sp they're kind of like middle grade books, but they're a lot of fun. It's basically about these kids in a house that has lots of secrets. And there we move on to my Sherlock Holmes books. Let's not acknowledge the fact that the entire back cover of this is missing. I mean, this is an old battered copy to be fair, but this is A Study in Scarlet and uh, yeah, I, I think this is probably one of the ones that I've had the longest. What else we got? His Last Bow and we've got this, I like the way this cover is done actually. This is an old Penguin classic and it's got As War with Germany Threatens, Sherlock Holmes takes the stage for his last bow. So yeah, this is uh, sh uh, short stories. Then we have The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Again, another collection of short stories. I think this is one of my favorite ones, actually. Let me just check which stories are in this. Yeah, we've got The Red-Headed League, which is one of my favorites. The Adventure of the Speckled Band, I like that one as well. Uh, so we've got, we've got a few, few decent stories in that one. Then we have The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. This is another collection of Holmes short stories. Let's see which ones are in this one, shall we? Well, it's got The Adventure of the Lion's Mane. That was a good one. The Adventure of the Creeping Man. And The Adventure of the Sussex Vampire. Actually, all of these are The Adventure of, which... which you would think <laughs> that would go in this one, but <laughs> never mind. Okay, then we have The Guards Came Through and Other Poems. So uh, this is just some of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's poetry. Not amazing, to be honest. Cheer, O oh comrades, we can bide the blast and face the gloom until it shall grow lighter. What though one Christmas should be overcast, if duty done makes all the others brighter. We have The Great Shadow and Other Napoleonic Tales. So this is basically all about the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle... He had a wide variety of interests. He actually used to get annoyed with Sherlock Holmes because it was all people ever talked to him about. As you can tell, I'm a bit of a, a bit of a Conan Doyle fan, so I have I have more than just his Holmes books, you know. Here we have the Hound of the Baskervilles, and I love this cover. Look at that! How cool is that? So this is a Penguin, another Penguin classic. This is probably his most well-known one, but it's actually not my favourite of his novels. It's a it's a good book though. I mean, they're all good books. Here we have The Hound of the Baskervilles, starring Dane Cobain by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Let me read you a bit of this. This is from You Star Novels. So they basically, because Sherlock Holmes is out of print and, it, you know, it's uh, public domain, they can take the text of it and just change the name of all of the characters in it. Mr. Dane Cobain, who is usually very late in the mornings, save upon those not infrequent occasions when he was up all night, was seated at the breakfast table. I stood upon the hearth rug and picked up the stick which our visitor had left behind him the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous-headed, of the sort which is known as a Penang lawyer. Just under the head was a broad silver band nearly an inch across. To James Mortimer, MRCS, from his friends of the CCH, was engraved upon it, with a date 1884. It was just such a stick as the old-fashioned family practitioner used to carry, dignified, solid and reassuring. Well, Refin, what do you make of it? Cobain was sitting with his back to me, and I'd given him no sign of my occupation. So Reffin is named after my friend Nick Reffin. Then we have Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The Last Galley, Impressions and Tales. A fascinating volume of tales from the creator of Sherlock Holmes. And this is just various short stories, really. So we do have the titular story, The Last Galley. Uh, I don't really remember any of these, to be honest. I remember some of the titles, but I don't remember the stories. It's been a long time since I read this. Here we have The Lost World. Uh, which is basically Jurassic Park, I assume Michael Crichton's later writing is based on this book, I don't know. I feel like this, this book doesn't get as much kind of uh, publicity as it deserves really, because obviously because Conan Doyle wrote Holmes, people tend to overlook The Lost World, but actually for me this is as good as something like, you know, The Time Machine or, you know, War of the Worlds even, something like that. It's I don't know, it's just a, a great little book and uh, I, I hon honestly, I recommend reading it. Then we have The Man from Archangel and Other Tales of Adventure by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Can't remember this one, I am very sorry. 
So this one, it looks like I read this back in 2011. Some of the stories in this are actually in uh, this one, The Last Galley as well. So there's a bit of overlapping there. Oh, this is, yeah, right, I remember now. So this is split up into tales of adventure and tales of medical life. Because obviously Arthur Conan Doyle used to be, a, he was a doctor. Uh, so so what he what he did with his stories is quite often he would write about being a doctor, you know. Here we have The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, another awesome cover here, Penguin Modern Classics. Let's see what's in this one. I think this is, uh, this is book number four of the series. And, uh, oh, The Greek Interpreter and the Naval Treaty. I remember both of those. And this also has the final problem, which I believe that is the story in which Holmes dies. And then... <laughs> And then Conan Doyle had to bring him back because the public was so annoyed at him, which is hilarious. He got held hostage by his own character. Here we have the mystery, the mystery of Clumber by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a novel, I want to say. I think it is a novel. Yeah. Again, couldn't tell you anything about it. If you go to socialbookshelves.com, which is my book blog, or also my Goodreads page, you can look up any book because these are all books that I've read. So even though I don't necessarily remember them at the time of filming, I did write reviews for them when I read them, if that makes sense. This one is heavy, Jesus. This is The Return of Sherlock Holmes. It's a nice little hardback version. I appreciate this is probably doing everyone's heading because a lot of people like to have matching sets and stuff, but I just collected these piecemeal as and when I could get them. It's got a little thing from the Reader's Digest in it. It's probably the most beautiful of my Sherlock Holmes books. It's even got like little illustrations and stuff. So that's, that's rather nice. Then we have The Sign of Four. So this is the first Sherlock Holmes book that I read. I've also seen it called The Sign of the Four. So I think you can pretty much call it whatever you want. And I read this for London in Literature when I was at university. And that was basically what introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. And what made me think, god damn, I need to read all of these. And so I did. I read all of the Sherlock Holmes books over the space of like that, that year at uni, I think. Here we have The Valley of Fear by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. A Sherlock Holmes story unabridged. This is uh, John Murray paperback edition. How good is that? It's, it's three and sixpence, it says on the front. So that that's harking back to the monetary system from before I was born. Okay, moving on from Conan Doyle, we have Alex Connor, The Rembrandt Secret. Now, this is very obviously a rip-off of The Da Vinci Code. I mean, you can tell from the cover and the title. However, my old best friend when I was growing up was called Alex Connor. He was actually Alexander Connor. And I don't, I assume this is maybe Alex, Alexandra Connor. Yeah, there we go. I read this. It was fine. Uh, it was, yeah. It's basically the Da Vinci Code set in London with paintings. Okay, then we have some Joseph Conrad. So we have Heart of Darkness, which is obviously what Apocalypse Now is based on or is loosely based on. It's almost a retelling. And actually, yeah. So this follows a guy called Marlow as he goes into Africa and goes deeper and deeper into the continent. And uh, yeah, it was, it was all right, actually. I did see Apocalypse Now before reading this as well. And it's not going to spoil it if you do that. And I actually think if you're thinking about reading Heart of Darkness, watch Apocalypse Now first because the story's different enough. You know what I mean? That you're, It's not going to spoil anything for you. But at the same time, then as you watch it, you can kind of see how Apocalypse Now was inspired by it. You know? Even using characters with names like Kurt, for example, who appears in this and in the movie. And then we have The Secret Agent, which... At the time I read this, I didn't enjoy much. I think maybe this was another one that I had to read for uni. And, uh, yeah, I didn't like it much at the time. But even now, just thinking back over it, I think I would like it now. You know, because especially because it's almost a tale of, uh, of, like, manipulation, like... You basically get the special needs character in this who's manipulated into becoming a terrorist. Next up we have a very specific book. This is the Baldur's Gate campaign setting manual thing. What's it called inside? So it's basically a game guide to Baldur's Gate, the computer game. But it's such a beautiful artifact and like a lot of it is really interesting because it goes into like the lore of the land and all that kind of stuff. And we've got things like maps and all of that stuff. This is by or at least the name attached to it. Because obviously some lowly paid intern copywriter probably actually wrote this. But the name attached to it is David Zeb Cook. So that's who wrote this. Okay, then we have Mervyn Cook. Oh, Derry Boy, A Childhood in Pictures and Poems. And basically, he's uh, he's an Irish guy, hence Derry Boy. He's a boy from Derry. And uh, he's a local author to me here in High Wycombe. So I bought his book. I just thought I'd check it out, you know. And, um, I mean, it's quite a sad book because a lot of it is dedicated to his his father, who I believe passed away. 
And uh, yeah, retold in pictures and words, written shortly after the death of the author's father in 2007. It's, it's all right, actually. The only problem is when he reads it live, because it's such a personal subject to him, it's kind of so sad and so depressing that it's difficult to listen to, you know. All right, next up we have Apollinaire, Cocteau and others, French poets of the Great War, and this is by Michael Kopp. This is basically an anthology of different poetry. Again, as it says, French poets from the Great War. It's actually one I was sent, and uh, I mean, it's pretty good if, if you want to learn about Apollinaire, Cocteau and others. I'm trying to find a short little poem I can read. The Cavalryman's Farewell, and this is by Guilam Apollinaire. Good God, what a delightful war, with its songs, its long leisure hours. I've polished this ring, the wind mingles with your sighs. Goodbye, time to saddle up. He disappeared at a bend in the road, and died over there while she laughed at fate's surprises. Published in the Mercure de France, 1st of July 1916. And yes, that was a badass French accent, thank you for noticing. All right, then we have Pop Charts by Paul Copperweight. So these are comedy graphs of your favourite tunes. So for example, this one here is uh, Things Meatloaf Would Do For Love. Anything and that. So I'll try and find some more. <laughs> Comparative weights of metals and family members. So that really small one there is my brother. Because obviously, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. Here we have Cressida Cowell, How To Train Your Dragon. And this is How To Break A Dragon's Heart. This is just How To Train Your Dragon. And yeah, these are two of the Cressida Cowell How to Train Your Dragon books. And actually, I really enjoyed them and I will probably be reading the rest of the series. I shall certainly be looking out for them in charity shops anyway. Okay, this is Robert X. Cringely, Accidental Empires. How the boys of Silicon Valley make their millions, battle foreign competition and still can't get a date. And this basically follows some of the leading figures in like the Silicon Valley tech startup world. This is actually fairly early on in terms of when it's all set. All right, then we have A.C. Crispin, The Hut Gambit, and The Paradise Snares. So that's book one and book two in the Han Solo trilogy in the Star Wars Expanded Universe. I actually recently read The Paradise Snare for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon, so I'll link to the review I posted of that below. And basically, yeah, if you like Star Wars, you're going to like these books. Then we have Lee Crompton, Digging Deeper. And I do remember getting this. This is one that I was sent. But I could not tell you for the life of me what it was about. So I assume I didn't particularly like it. I don't know. But, yeah. So up next we have Heavier Than Heaven, the biography of Kurt Cobain by Charles R. Cross. As you can probably tell from my name, I used to be a bit of a Kurt Cobain fan. So, uh, yeah, I just read his, uh, his, his biography. It's a pretty good one, actually. There are a bunch of different Kurt Cobain biographies out there. There's even just a book called Who Killed Kurt Cobain, which I will get to eventually. But, um, yeah, that's probably, like, the most well-known one or, or at least one of the most reputable ones. And we have The Trader of Saigon by Lucy Crookshanks, and that would be Lucy from Book Axe here on Booktube. Again, I read this recently and reviewed it. This was for Tarden Danes, indie read-along. So I will link to the review of that below. Here we have CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, Case Files, and this is by Collins, Rodriguez, and Wood. Ooh, it does actually have names to it. I've just been using this storing this alphabetically as CSI. Written by Max Allen Collins, art by Gabriel Rodriguez and Ashley Wood. And yeah, it's it's literally a graphic novel of CSI. Like, look, there's fucking Gil Grissom. <laughs> then we have E.E. E. Cummings, Selected Poems, 1923 to 1958. Quite like Cum Cummings. This one actually has notes all over it as well. Again, I bought this one secondhand, so it came with somebody's annotations. Didn't bother me. I, I didn't really read their annotations, to be fair. I think I glanced at the odd ones. Then we have J.C. Cuthbert, Changing More Than Our Spots. This is a poetry collection again. I can't really remember this one either. So again, I don't think it made much of an impact. And we're finally on to D. So this is number seven, bookshelf tour number seven. And we finally got to D by author surname. So the rest of the books in this video are all going to be by the same author. And that is, of course, Roald Dahl. So we have Boy, Tales of Childhood, which is kind of autobiographical really one of his finer books actually I think I had to study that for something maybe secondary school or uni I can't remember but um yeah probably one of the best memoirs especially of childhood that I've, I've, I've come across let me have Roald Dahl Charlie and the Chocolate Works so this is Charlie and the Chocolate Factory in Scots let me read you the blurb and try and do it in a Scottish accent let me let me get ready oh I'm Scottish 
When Mr. Wooly Wonka invites five bands Ben into his world famous chocolate factory, some of them turn out to be spoilt wee bam ports. For Charlie Buffy, the tour of Wonka's chocolate works is the adventure of a lifetime. Where's the accent gone? It's just got it's gone. Has Violet Beauregard bit enough mad and she can chow? Will Mike TV here finally end up on TV? Will Charlie go up and oot in Willy Wonka's muckle glass lift? Find do in Matthew Fitz Gallus New Scots translation a old Dahl's classic story Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, I ended up going northern there. Sound like I'm from Barnsley. Then we have Danny and the Champion of the World. I actually didn't like this one too much, but then I did first read this when I was an adult, so you know. Swings and roundabouts. And I think everyone, or most people, have their favourite Roald Dahl books. For some reason, Hannah Tay doesn't like Roald Dahl. But I think she's just broken inside. So, uh, this is SEO Trot about tortoise. Very short and sweet. I actually read this one as a grown-up, but did like this one. And um, this one is like one that's overlooked a lot. But equally, I know it's a lot of people's favourite too. So, here we have Fantastic Mr. Fox. Which, uh, yeah, I mean, it's iconic. There's obviously the movie of it. Again, I didn't really like that one too much, actually. It was fine. I, th I thought the fox was a bit of a dick, though. I mean, obviously, you're supposed to take his side against the farmers. I suppose it doesn't help that I'm a vegetarian. So I'm like, well, he kept on killing those animals and stuff. But let me have probably my favourite Roald Dahl, which is George's Marvelous Medicine. Fun fact, I used to try and make my own Marvelous Medicines as a kid, and I distinctly remember making this one, like, concoction where I just mixed loads of stuff together that I found in the bathroom. And uh, when you sprayed it with deodorant, it made flames come up, so it would go like... It was amazing. I was about six years old, making a fire. Okay, then we have James and the Giant Peach. Again, another one that isn't necessarily my favourite. I do quite like the movie of this, but I haven't seen it for a while. And yeah, the story's fine. It's just, uh, it's not his best. Then we have Matilda, which obviously everyone loves Matilda. It's not my favourite Roald Dahl, but it's, it's, it's one of his good ones. And uh, obviously the movie's great as well. I kind of want to read the book that the actress who played Matilda has written. I can't remember her name off the top of my head. But uh, it's meant to be a really good book. So that's, that's a fun fact for this one, I guess. Then we have Someone Like You. And this is like adult story. So there's a, a quote here on the back. Roald Dahl's particular brand of bizarre, alarming, and disturbing story telling. Oh shit, that's badly punctuated, sorry. Roald Dahl's particular brand of bizarre, alarming, and disturbing storytelling has already attracted a huge following, which can only be more disturbed, alarmed, and thankfully amused by someone like you. This is definitely not one to give to a child, but you can kind of guess that from like the. I mean, it looks like an old Asimov or something like that. And I remember these as being vaguely erotic at times. So, there's that. I mean, if you want to see a new side to Roald Dahl, it's probably a good one to uh, to go for. Then we have the BFG, which it used to scare me. <laughs> I think it was actually the TV movie, or I don't know, maybe it was an actual movie movie that used to scare me. But uh, yeah, I think I think as well. This was one where I kind of was really familiar with the movie before I read the book. But it's it's you know it's a good enough story. And we have here the complete adventures of Charlie and Mr. Willy Wonka. So this is basically a bind up of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, which is the sequel. I think a lot of people dislike Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, but I thought it was fine. It's not as good as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but both of them were just cracking stories. And, you know, I used to read this over and over again when I was a kid. Then we have the giraffe and the Pelly and me. I don't think I can summarize this better than the blurb does. A bucket, a ladder, and a cleaner. How about a pelican, a giraffe, and a monkey? Not the usual ingredients, but this is a window cleaning company with a difference. Join Billy as he makes friends with three amazing animals and gets up to some thrilling adventures. And on the back we've got, This edition has been produced exclusively for Nestle Cheerios, Honey Nut Cheerios, and Shreddies. Not for resale. Pretty sure I bought this from a little girl at a car boot sale. That's not weird at all. Okay, then we have The Twits, which I did used to quite like this. It's actually, uh... Quite a good example of like fundamentally unlikable protagonists in children's literature. You don't tend to see that too often, but uh, you know that does happen here. But it's fine. The twits, it's all right. It's, it's all right. 
And then we have the witches, which is another one that used to give me nightmares. It's weird because as an adult, I tend to think of Dahl as this, just this quirky little children's author. No, he used to scare the crap out of me. I don't know how or why, he just did. So there we have it. That is it for this edition of my bookshelf tours. In my next one, I can see we've got Terry Deary over there. We've got Charles Darwin, Richard Dawkins, and we also have all of my Colin Dexter books as well. Samuel R. Delaney, Daniel Defoe I see as well. So we've got some good books and authors coming in the next one. So, on that note, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.